Hello, I'm Stephen Lee. I'm an elder at First Presbyterian Church of Mesquite, Texas. And I'm the teacher of the discipleship Sunday school class there. Today we're continuing our study with the book of John, still on the first chapter, going through it kind of laborsome, maybe uh, one or two verses at a time. The last time we met, we studied that great verse 14. And now we're continuing today with verses 15 through 17 and then verse 18. John testified to him and cried out, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks ahead of me, because he was before me. From his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. The law indeed was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. We've already seen that the fourth gospel was written in a situation where it was necessary to make sure that John the Baptist did not occupy an exaggerated position in anyone's thinking. So John begins this passage with a saying of John the Baptist, which gives Jesus the first place. And I think it's interesting that he put it in parenthesis almost like he was thinking about it at that moment, and he wanted to make sure he didn't forget about it. In this saying, John the Baptist says of Jesus, He who comes after me ranks ahead of me because he was before me. Now that's kind of a confusing way to say something, and of course he may mean more than one thing by that. First, Jesus was actually six months younger than John. John the Baptist may be saying quite simply, He who is my junior has been advanced beyond me. Second, John the Baptist may be saying, I was on the scene before Jesus. I occupied center stage before he did. My hand was laid to work before his was, but all that I was doing was to prepare the way for his coming. I was only the herald to the king. Third, it may be that John is thinking in terms much deeper than that. He may be thinking in terms not of time, but of eternity. He may be thinking of Jesus, as the one who existed before the world began. That word we've been studying about, the mind of God. And it may be that all three ideas are in John's mind. But it was not he who had exaggerated his own position. That was the mistake that some of John the Baptist's followers had made. To John the Baptist, the highest place belonged to Jesus. The passage goes on to say three great things about Jesus. First, on his fullness, we have all drawn. The word that John uses for fullness is a great word. It means the sum total of all that is God. It's a word that Paul uses often. Paul used it to mean that in Jesus there dwelt the totality of the wisdom the power, and the love of God. And because of that, Jesus is inexhaustible. We can go to Jesus with any need and find that need supplied. In Jesus, one can find ideals, beauty, knowledge, courage, power, and forgiveness. In Jesus, the fullness of God, all that is in God, is available to everyone. Second, from him we've received grace upon grace. Now literally, the Greek means grace instead of grace. And what does that strange phrase mean? First, it may mean that in Christ we have found one wonder leading to another. 
Now, I told you the story earlier about my trip to the Grand Canyon and how when I would go out on the South Rim and look at the canyon, I would be amazed at each site that I would see. So sometimes when we travel, vista after vista opens to us, and at every turn we think nothing could be lovelier. Then an even lovelier sight appears before us. When we embark on the study of some great subject like music or poetry or art, we never get to the end of it. There are always fresh experiences of beauty and knowledge waiting for us. And so it is with Christ. The more we know of him, the more wonderful he becomes. This phrase may be John's way of expressing the limitness of Christ. Second, it may be that we ought to take this expression literally. In Christ, we find grace instead of grace. The different ages and different situations in life demand a different kind of grace. We need one grace in days of prosperity and another in days of adversity. We need one grace in the sunlit days of youth and another when the shadows of age begin to lengthen. We need one grace when we feel on top of things and another when we are depressed and discouraged. We need one grace to bear our burdens and another to help us bear another's burdens. The grace of God is not static. It's a dynamic thing. And it never fails to meet whatever situation we find ourselves in. All through life, we're constantly receiving grace instead of grace. For the grace of Christ is triumphantly adequate to deal with any situation. Third, the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. In the old way, life was governed by the law. People had to do something whether or not they liked it and whether or not they knew the reason they were doing it. With the coming of Jesus, we no longer seek to obey the law of God like slaves. We seek to answer the love of God like sons and daughters. It's through Jesus Christ that God the lawgiver has become God the Father. Verse 18. No one has ever seen God. It is God, the only Son, who is close to the Father's heart, who has made him known. When God said that no one has ever seen God, everyone in the ancient world would have agreed with him. People were fascinated and depressed and frustrated by what they regarded as the infinite distance and inability to know God. In the Old Testament, God is represented as saying to Moses, You cannot see my face, for no one shall see me and live. When God reminds the people of the giving of the law, he says, You heard the sounds of words, but saw no form, only a voice. No one in the Old Testament thought it was even possible to see God. As the New Testament scholar T.R. Glover said, whatever God was, he was far from being within the reach of ordinary men and women. But God does not stop there. He goes on to make the startling and tremendous statement that Jesus has fully revealed to us what God is like. Here again, the keynote of John's Gospel sounds, if you want to see what God is like, just look at Jesus. John says three things about the power of Jesus to reveal God to men and women. First, Jesus is unique. The Greek word for unique is translated here as only begotten. But the Greek word came to have two special meanings by the time John used it here. It had come to mean not only unique, but also specially loved. Obviously, an only child has a unique place. It's the conviction of the New Testament 
that there is no one like Jesus. He alone can bring God to us and us to God. Second, Jesus is God. Here we have exactly the same form of expression that we had in the first verse of the first chapter. It does not mean that Jesus is identical with God. It means that in mind and character and being, he is one with God. In this case, it might be preferable if we thought of it as meaning that Jesus is divine. To see Jesus is to see what God is. Third, Jesus is in the bosom of the Father. To be in the bosom of someone is the Hebrew phrase which expresses the deepest intimacy possible in human life. It's used of mother and child. It's used of husband and wife. It's used of two friends who are in complete communion with each other. When John uses this phrase about Jesus, he means that between Jesus and God, there is complete and uninterrupted intimacy. It's because Jesus is so intimate with God that he is one with God and he can reveal God to us. In Jesus Christ, the distant, unknowable, invisible, unreachable God has come to men and women. And God can never be a stranger to us again. Thank you for watching. And I want to thank everyone out there for their prayers while we were laid up during the last two weeks. We sure appreciate it, and we can feel your presence. God bless.